All right. Welcome to CS 110. I'm Chris Gregg, teaching CS 110 this quarter. Uh, welcome. The uh, room, we actually, we, we were going to be in the nice spacious room next door, but turns out 106A is gigantic, as you might imagine. So we're kind of in here. The bad news is every single one of you is going to be coming to every single lecture, so all the seats will be taken, I'm sure. Um, we'll talk more about if you decide not to attend lecture, what, uh, what that means uh, and uh, as we go along. Um, CS 110, Principles of Computer Systems. I assume at this point you have gone through either CS 106A or some AP class, CS 106B and CS 107. If you haven't gone through those, that series of courses, welcome to everybody. Come on, you can find a seat, I'm sure. There's some seats in the middle. You can, I'm sure you can find some. Um, if you haven't taken that sequence, especially CS106B and CS107, this class is going to be challenging. Now, the class is challenging in general, uh, as you can imagine. But um, it's kind of, in some sense, you do a, we will do a lot of things in here that you have seen in 106B because you're going to be building big programs that, are, that mean you have to use a bunch of the data structures you've used in CS106B. And a lot of the class is in C++, so you have to remember that sort of thing. And then CS107, the systemsy stuff, well, this is also a systems class, and so you need to know what pointers are, and you need to know what void stars are. Not too, too much, but you need to understand those. You need to understand what structs are and, and all those things. Um, so we will do like one minute of uh, assembly code, but that's it. So you, you have passed that, uh, that barrier from 107, um, and that's that. So, uh, what is this class all about? Um, there are actually five main topics, and the odds are very good that you have not seen any of those topics before in great detail. You may have kind of seen some of them, and if you've done some programming on your own, you may have seen some of them, uh, but there's basically five main things. The first thing we're gonna cover, and I'll go over some more in detail in a few minutes as well, but here's the big thing, Unix file system. So you know a little bit about files, and you've used Unix if you've done, uh, if you've logged into Myth from CS107, etc. Um, but we're going to talk about how the actual file system itself is built. Like, what does it mean to be a file system? How do you actually take, keep track of where the various bytes are in a file? And how do you keep track of the file names? And how do you look up file names and all that sort of stuff? So that's kind of the first big topic, and you'll have an assignment on that. Um, then we go into this thing called multiprocessing. Okay. On your computer, you guys know that you can be browsing the internet at the same time that you can be printing a document, at the same time that you can be uh, downloading a file, at the same time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This all happens because your computers are running multiple programs at exactly the same time. Okay? Even if you only have one processor on your computer, the operating system is smart enough to say, hey, uh, I've got two programs or 20 programs running. I'm going to time slice them and give a little bit of this program some time to do its thing and then a little bit of this program, et cetera, et cetera. And as it does that, you, it seems to the user, more or less, that all these things are actually happening at the same time. Now, if your computer does have multiple processors or multiple cores, things can literally happen at the same time. So we're going to run, run we are going to write a bunch of programs that utilizes this. We're going to write a program that does what we call forking and sets off another process at the exact same time as the first process and they go at the same time. Okay? The tricky part of this is debugging it. You guys think you're great at debugging. Well, wait till you have two or 20 things going at the same time trying to debug. It's a little bit trickier. So we have to talk about those sorts of things. So that's the next thing. Um, the third thing, which is kind of part of multiprocessing, is signal handling. It turns out that if you have multiple processes going at the same time on your computer, you might want to talk, you might want them to talk to each other. Okay? It turns out when you do this thing called fork, which we'll talk about again later, um, you actually get a parent process and then a child process. And if you want to talk between them, or if the parent wants to know when the child has finished, well, signals get sent. So those are the things we're going to talk about there. All right, then we're going to go and we're going to shift into this thing called multi-threading, which is a very similar sort of topic, but it involves uh, these things called threads, which means one program is now running, well, one process is now running multiple things at once. It's very similar, but handled in a much different way. So we're going to transition into that. And then finally, 
we're going to go into uh, talking a little bit about networks. So we're going to build some servers, and we're going to build some clients, and we're going to have them talk to each other on different machines and through the internet and so forth. And that's going to uh, be the kind of the culminating part of the course. So those are the big topics. Now, what are all those topics all about? Well, most of them happen to do with have to do with operating system sort of things. So 110 a lot of times is considered like operating systems light. Uh, and it's kind of an introduction to operating systems. If you do want to take operating systems, you can take CS140 and, uh, and go uh, take an actual operating systems class. But uh, we're going to talk about all these things that the operating system has to help you do in this course. Okay? There are eight assignments. There will be eight assignments. Um, roughly one a week, a little bit more than one a week. Um, in the midterm, we're extending the assignment a little, a little longer so you have time to study, etc. Um, the, uh, you can look at what, the, what all those are, but they're basically assignments that test all the things that we talk about, obviously. And there's a couple multiprocessing ones and a couple threading ones and, and so forth. And then there's a culminating pro uh, project called MapReduce, which, is a, uh, which has threading and processes and networking and it's all kind of tied into one and it's kind of a cool big ass last assignment. All right, so that's kind of the overview of the course. Um, who am I? I've seen, I see some friendly faces out there that I've seen, all of you are friendly I hope. I've seen some people I know before. Um, uh, but uh, if you haven't had me for a class before, I am, uh, my original bachelor's degree was in electrical engineering uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, then I decided, I actually went into the Navy right after that, and then decided to uh, go into teaching. So I went and got a master's degree in education and then decided a little bit later on that uh, I still had some GI Bill, which is the Navy's or the military's kind of money for college that they let people use. Um, and I still had some of that, so I decided to go get a PhD in computer engineering and thinking that I still wanted to teach. And so that kind of led me to Tufts University in Massachusetts and then out here. I've been here for three years. I'm technically a junior now. So um, some of you guys are more, have been here longer than me. Um, and uh, that's that. Uh, so I've lectured a whole bunch of classes. This is why I recognize some of you is because I've lectured 106B, 106X, 107, 107E, 208E, uh, which is a great ideas in computer science. I'm going to do it again next year, and it's a fun course. Um, and uh, it's very, generally very small, and we talk about all these big ideas in computer science over the years, kind of like a history class. That was fun. And then now CS110. Um, the, uh, as far as uh, teaching CS110, my first quarter was last quarter. Uh, normally, Jerry Kane teaches this course. He's actually not here this uh, quarter, and I kind of wanted to roll into 110, so I co-taught it with Jerry last quarter. Uh, the class is ostensibly his class. Like he, pr he put most of it together. We are not going to change too much. Okay, I'm a very different lecturer than Jerry, but the material is all the same, um, So, uh, except for a couple of minor tweaks here and uh, and there. Um, so I'm going to keep it mostly, mostly the same. Um, a little bit more about me. I love to tinker. If you haven't seen my um, typewriter project, my musical typewriter project, you can just look it up, Chris Gregg typewriter on the internet and you can find it. Um, and then, uh, or you can come by my office and actually see it in real life. Um, I love uh, kind of doing, you know, everything from soldering to Arduinos to Raspberry Pi stuff. So if you have any projects you're working on in that, feel free to stop by and chat with me about that. All right. Okay, uh, so who else uh, is going to be involved in this class? Well, as of noon today, there's 209 students enrolled. It's not a huge, huge class, but it's still relatively big. Um, what do you need to uh, know for the class? Well, we're going to be primarily programming in a combination of C and C++. Most of the projects are actually going to be C++. The reason for that is it's much easier to use C++ strings. We've got all these cool things like maps and, and uh, sets and things that you can use. Uh, by the way, we will be using the standard template library, not the Stanford library. So for instance, uh, if you want to use a, uh, if you want to use a queue, you do, um, if you want to get the front value off the queue, you do pop underscore front, and that pops the value off, but it doesn't give it back to you. If you just do front, it gives it back to you. So there's a couple of nuances that, uh, that you have to learn. Most of those things will come relatively naturally. It will not take long to, uh, to learn that. There's a few, few things about using maps that are a little tricky. I will do my best to kind of preview you on any new C++ things that you might not have seen in CS110. Uh, for instance, there's these things called closures, which we're going to have for the first assignment and then through most of the other assignments. And you have to learn how to use those, and I'm going to explain how to use those. So uh, don't, don't worry too, too much about that. 
We do write pretty complex programs in this class. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means you're going to have uh, a large code base that you are going to have to build part of. And you kind of did this a little bit for CS110 and maybe a little for CS107. This is kind of even more so. People always go and they look at the first assignment and they go, the assignment's like 15 pages long <laughs> or whatever, right? And, and the number of files you get is like 22 files and half of them are header files and whatever. You really need to be able to comprehend those things before you even start writing any code. Um, so I'll try to, we'll, we'll, the first assignment's a good example of, hey, there's a bunch of code here, you have to figure out where to put your pieces. And that's sometimes the, one of the harder parts about the course itself. Um, you should be able to trace memory diagrams. I mean, you should understand memory. If you took CS 107, I'm confident you understand enough about memory to do just uh, fine in this class. Um, you should also understand Unix and Linux and the terminal and so forth. Um, GCC and Valgrind. If you took CS 107E, for instance, you probably have no idea what I mean when I say Valgrind. It's just a program you run that tells you when your uh, program's leaking memory or you haven't closed files, etc. Not very hard to use. Um, and then make and, and so forth. You won't have to write any make files, uh, but you might want to modify them. So not a bad idea to, uh, to do that. There are 10 CAs. Um, this is roughly the same proportion of CAs as you would have seen in 107. Um, that means that there's 200 of you and there's 10 CAs. Well, it means that there's uh, possibly longer lines than you might hope for in ops hours. That's the way it goes. Um, the one thing about office hours, and I think this is covered on another slide too, is the difference in 110 versus 107 is the CAs are not going to look at your code. So you bring a bug to the to office hour, and you go, I've got this bug, and they go, great, tell me about your bug. What's going on? What did you do here? What did you do there? They're not going to sit down and try to help you find the bug. You guys are, believe it or not, you're good enough programmers now, you can probably track down where your bug is. Right? It is harder when you get into multi-threading and multi-processing things, but by this point you're, uh, you are fairly uh, advanced and we expect you to do that. And it does make office hours go smoother. I mean, if you, you, unfortunately, some of the assignments are very, they're not open-ended so much as we say write this function and you just kind of go and write it and your decisions might be very different than your neighbor's decisions and it would be impossible for the CA to sit down and try to figure out what the differences are in the 10 minutes that they might be able to give to you. So, so that's that. For what it's worth, most people think it's a, it works pretty well. Like you, you'd be surprised at how talking through what you think should be happening in your program translates into you being able to fix your own bugs. Surprising. You're not in 106B anymore, 107, where you can, you know, you, you can rely on the TAs and CAs to do that. Okay? Uh, the CAs are also going to hold uh, lab sections. I'll talk about labs uh, in a few minutes. So for what it's worth, the class is held Monday, Wednesday, 1.30 to 2.50. And then Fridays um, are most of the labs during the same time frame. There are also some labs on Thursdays. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, sign up for those. I'll talk more about um, labs in a minute. Labs are just, they're, they're not sitting at a computer, although you should bring your laptop, uh, but it's uh, run by a uh, CA. And they, they, people like those too, because you get a little bit more uh, small kind of feel for the, for the teaching. All right, what questions do you have so far? Anything? We will get to more logistics. I promise not to do all logistics. We're gonna get into some real stuff today too. Uh, of course, website, cs110.stanford.edu. Um, as you might imagine. Uh, the, uh, so the website is not you know, super detailed with stuff. It's got the lectures on it, it's got uh, the lecture slides, it's got the handouts, it's got uh, discussion section information and the links and so forth. Uh, but that's about it. It's got a calendar which lists all of the, uh, it lists, it, right now it lists when all the assignments are going to be given out. Um, the due dates are kind of still to be a little bit uh, determined as well. Uh, we will also have a piazza as you can imagine. Um, piazza gets pretty busy uh, because lots of people have lots of questions and keep up to that, keep up to date on that and you'll be uh, in pretty good shape. And then we'll also have a Slack uh, channel just in case you want to chat. Um, I'm not having the CAs go to the Slack channel. I'll keep my eye on it if you have specific questions, um, but it's more for you guys to chat amongst yourselves if you want. Um, questions and things generally go to Piazza, as you can imagine. But if you have something you want to chat about, then Slack's a better, better place for that. Um, I have some office hours. You can find out when those are. Um, if you can't make my office hours and you really want to chat with me directly, shoot me an email um, and we'll find a time to meet. Uh, CAs, of course, will have their own office hours and 
We will probably start them this week, but they will be official as of next, like the, the weekend, um, because your first assignment is coming out on Wednesday. Okay, as I said, CAs don't look at your code during office hours. Neither will I for what it's worth. Now, if you've got something you don't understand, an error message certainly will look at you. It's not like we're like, no, I can't you see your screen, right? We're gonna be able to see, like, they help you at least get, figure out what error messages are and so forth. And if you haven't done much C++ programming, you'll know that error messages in C++ are ridiculous. So that uh, does take a little bit of time to get your head wrapped around. Okay, there's two textbooks for the course. Um, the textbook that you may have used for 107, uh, the Bryant and O'Halloran, uh, Halloran, I forget how to pronounce his name, textbook is uh, the same one. There is actually a custom version just for 110, which has, you know, the six or eight chapters we're gonna cover in one, uh, 110 if you wanna buy that, or if you bought the, the whole book last time, continue to use it. It doesn't really matter so much if you have an, a slightly older version. It's basically for you to read. I'm not assigning anything from the book, and most of the things haven't changed. And it's not like 107 where the older versions were in 32-bit architecture, and now we're talking about 64-bit architecture. We really don't get into those details in this class, so it's still fine. Question? Yeah. All right. Uh, there's another textbook which will primarily be for the first couple of weeks on file systems um, that talks about file systems. It's, it's called Principles of Computer System Design. And if you want to do well on assignment two, read the book because it has all the details for the, uh, for the, the way the, an old Unix file system was built. So when we get to that, uh, you'll see those reading assignments come up. You can buy it. It's also available free online. Okay. All right, uh, lecture example. So this class is, I'm gonna have slides, but I'm also gonna do lots of coding, kind of live or kind of from my notes, et cetera, where you're gonna see lots of code uh, put up and run in real life. And um, the code examples, if you wanna either follow along or look at them yourselves, you can get them by, uh, uh, you can get them online. I generally have links on the slides, or you can actually clone the entire re repository of all the uh, examples. I would really suggest looking at those examples and understanding how they work, especially if they fly by in lecture and you go, I don't really know what that is. Go down and look at them line by line, test some things, try it out yourself, and uh, that's a good way to, to get yourself up to speed on those assignments or those, uh, those code examples, okay? Everything we do is gonna be done on the MIF machines. Um, if you need to, you could do it on Cardinal, I believe, too, but the machines that we'll use for class are MIF, the MIF machines. Um, if for some reason you're going out of town and you're gonna be on an airplane and don't have internet access, we can figure out how to get most things working on your laptop itself, especially if you have a Mac. Um, but you can also get a, uh, you can also put a Linux machine, uh, a VM on your computer, and that will work, too. So we can, we can get that to work. But most all the assignments, just like 107, are going to be on the MIF machines. Okay, all right, what else? Uh, the slides, so I'm gonna try to make the slides as comprehensive as possible. I, I, I think putting, sometimes you'll, the complaints I sometimes get are, there's too many words on the slides, there's too much stuff on the slides. I'll try not to focus on like the stuff, and I certainly will try not to read like whole slides and so forth, but you can use them a little bit for reference as well. Um, so it's not a, not a bad idea to, uh, to do that. Um, they're not a substitute for attending lecture because um, we do go off script and you'll ask lots of good questions and that will get, those will get answered and we'll try things and, and so forth that uh, aren't gonna be reflected in the slides. Um, and, uh, and anything we talk about in class really is going to be covered on the midterms and short answer questions and so forth. I mean, if it's way off topic, it won't be, of course, but um, you should be responsible for that. Um, now, while I'm thinking about it, uh, as far as the class itself being videotaped, it is not being videotaped. I'm wearing a microphone and it looks like it's being videotaped, but it's not. Um, I will generally put together a screencast, which means it's just gonna be what you see on the board and me talking, you won't see me at all. Um, and some people like to rely on those. If you do rely on those, just know that sometimes my computer breaks or I forget to do the screencast or whatever, don't blame me. If you don't wanna to come to class, don't blame me. Um, but, uh, but I will do my best to try to have the resources available. I do that not so that you can miss class and time shift the lectures, but more so that if you need to go back and look at something from lecture, it's a good idea to do that. That's why I do it. Some people time shift it and I'm not gonna complain about it, but uh, it's nice to see your smiling faces here regardless. Okay. What questions so far? There's lots of logistics so far. 
Okay, I talked, whoops, I talked most about this, mostly um, about these things um, already. The, the, and this kind of goes over some of the uh, syllabus again, and you can get the, the syllabus online, and I've already put these, some of the details on the calendar as well. Um, but as I said, the first thing we're gonna talk about starting today is Linux file systems and how file systems actually work and some of the different system calls that we will use. And by the way, that word system call is uh, something that you may not have heard before. It's basically a function that ends up getting run by the kernel, which is run by the operating system. So you've got your program doing its thing, and then it does a system call, which looks just like a function call, into the kernel, and the kernel does all the stuff that, that touches the system, like files and networking and, and so forth. And that's so that you don't have access directly in your own programs, and it's a security feature of the, uh, of the operating system. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll talk about naming and layering, and we'll talk about um, uh, we'll talk about these things called inodes, which are the uh, the way the computer keeps track of your files. Lo and behold, computers actually put a number associated with all your files. Go figure, <laughs> right? Of course it does, right? Because computers like numbers better than words. So um, that's uh, there's this thing called an inode, which kind of distinguishes your file from some other one, and it's just a number. As it turns out, we'll talk about that. Uh, then, as I said, we'll go into multiprocessing, and we'll do these things called forking, which is branching of your program, as, uh, as it almost sounds like. And then there's uh, you have to be able to coordinate those things. So we'll use things like wait PID and exec CVP, which means, which basically means, take your take another program and start running it immediately that's already that's on your system. It's a cool way to run external programs while your program is uh, doing things. One of the assignments for that is called Stanford Shell, which is basically what your shell is doing. I mean, if we go over here and we say uh, ls, right? Well, there's a program running the shell, which is what the which is what you're typing, right? And then when I type ls, that's another program and your shell says to the operating system, "Hey, run that ls program." and then come back to me and go from there. So that's what's happening when you type ls. It's a multi-processing endeavor right there, okay? All right, um, we are going to also talk about protected address spaces and a little bit about virtual memory. You know how you've, you know on the, uh, let's see if I can do this. You know how on, um, you know how on uh, in your like CS107 we drew all these memory diagrams and we said that well it's not going to look very good here oh they're not here do these memory diagrams and like here's the heap and here's the stack and like or it's the other way around sorry the stack grows down stacks up here and then the heaps down here I'm doing it backwards it depends on which class you teach about how you draw those but anyway uh, stack goes down the heap goes up and and this like starts at some value and this Okay, it's all a lie <laughs> for what it's worth. It turns out that every program thinks it has access to the entire memory system. And it's all faked out by that, right? The entire program, like the, your program says, oh, I have access to all the memory. Well, really, whenever it accesses memory, the operating system gets in the way, the way and says, okay, you're actually looking at over here, but you think you're looking at this part of memory. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a neat way to, um, to virtualize things, and we call it virtual memory because of that. And it, um, the, the reason we do that is so that it simplifies your program. It's not like your program needs to know, oh, I'm shoehorned into this little part of memory here, I get the entire system. Well, we'll make it look like you have the entire system and we'll take care of the, the handshaking that makes, makes it, uh, it go back to, uh, to the original, or to, to make it look like you know what you're doing and actually stores things where it really is. We'll get into the details of that. That's all part of multiprocessing, exceptional control flow, et cetera. Okay? Um, we'll also talk a little about concurrency versus parallelism. Concurrency is this idea that two or more things are happening at the same time. Parallelism is the idea that you've got a big problem that you're breaking into chunks and solving at the same time. So there's, there's a little bit of a difference there um, in uh, like idea and abstraction. We'll get to those things. And we'll also talk about how to send signals between different uh, programs. Okay. Then I said we're going to talk about uh, threading, which is another concurrency kind of idea. And this is where you can actually emulate many real world things using this threading idea, where you basically say, hey, I've got a whole bunch of tasks to do, and they might communicate between each other. I'm going to set part of my program off doing these things 
independently of everything else until it receives a message to go do like work with something else. So they're happening kind of all at the same time, and it models some nice problems for us. So we will uh, we'll do that. Um, we also have to talk about uh, this idea that if you have two things both trying to access a data structure at the same time, let's say they both are trying to add things to a set or read from a set or so forth. If they're trying to do that at the same time and we only have one copy of the set, guess what? We're going to run into problems unless we say, hey, you go first and then you go first, or then you go second, right? And one, one after the other. And we may not be able to order those necessarily. That's the other thing about this class. There's a lot of non-deterministic things that are going to happen in your programs. Okay, and I don't mean things that are just bugs. I mean like you have things that when you run it two times in a row and it's perfectly written, it will produce two different outputs because it just happens that the operating system grabbed this part of the program first before this one and it did it in a slightly different order. So those sorts of things are, we'll have to contend with those as we go through the, as we go through the course. Okay, um, but anyway, the point is that when you're trying to access that one data structure with two different threads, you need to do what we call locking, where you basically say, "I'm going to access it now. Anybody else has to wait, and then the next, and then the next thread can can go and do it." So we will get into those details. It's kind of fun when it works, and uh, it is a little challenging to get it right, but it is fun when it works. Okay, all right, and uh, and then we're going to talk about there's some differences between the way threads work in C and C++. Most of the stuff we do will be in C++, but we'll see the differences. Okay. All right, and then finally, as I said, we're going to do uh, networking. And networking is, as you might expect, it's two computers talking to each other, or, or a computer talking to itself through this thing called a port. Uh, and this, uh, this involves IP addresses, which is how the internet determines what computer your computer is. Um, if you type myth.stanford.edu, it goes to a particular bank of computers, and that's an, over the network, of course. Uh, we'll write some very trivial web pages that we'll um, actually be accessing to, uh, so that you can test some of your programs with your browser, and uh, we'll go into that. And we'll also go into some of the details of HTTP, which is the protocol used on the internet to send and receive data. Like it has to be two computers when they're talking to each other had better agree on what language they're using and what protocol they're using. Otherwise, they'd never be able to talk. And HTTP happens to be the way uh, the way that works. Okay. And then finally, as I said, we're going to end up doing this program called MapReduce, uh, which is an idea of taking a problem, breaking it into many parts, having lots of different computers work on all those parts, and then collecting the data back again for a final answer. So that's uh, that's the. Uh, the final thing. And then the last thing we'll talk about for the last couple of days of class, there's not an actual assignment on it, is what we call non-blocking I.O. And by blocking we mean, we're going to see an example of blocking later today. By blocking we mean uh, the program when you're asking for data will wait for that data to arrive and that's called blocking. Otherwise we can have it ask for data and then keep going if the data is, doesn't, it hasn't available yet and then comes back later and checks again. So that's the last thing we're going to do. Okay? So that's the big thing. Like I said, most of the stuff in this class is all about like operating systems sort of things. So you're gonna, we're going to get uh, into some of the details of what the operating system is actually doing for you, in particular the Linux operating system. But guess what? The Mac operating system and the Windows operating system and the Raspberry Pi's operating system and all that are really the same sort of um, Thing. They're, they're all doing the same, have the same sort of features. Because some people decided a while ago, hey, those are cool features that we'd like to have. That's the other thing, by the way. In this class, we'll talk about a lot of things and you'll say to yourself, huh, that seems really specific. <laughs> like doing this this way seems like a really specific way of doing it. And you're absolutely right. It was some people, some very clever people in my opinion, who made decisions to do something this way. There are many, many other ways to do it. We're going to look at a file system for our second assignment, and you're going to have to know all the nuances of how that file system works, and all these things about block numbers, and inode numbers, and how to, how to access, and how much data is stored, and so forth. That wasn't the only way to do this. In fact, newer operating systems have different file systems, and your Mac has a different file system, and Windows has a different file system. It's just one way of doing it, and we want you to appreciate that aspect of it, not necessarily to say, oh my gosh, this is the one way to do it and I better memorize this exact way of doing it. I mean, you do have to know it, but you, you don't have to uh, specifically think, oh, that's the only way of doing it. Please don't think that. Okay. 
All right, uh, a little bit more logistics here. Um, programming assignments, 40% of your grade, they're uh, the most important part all at once is um, uh, there's eight assignments, as I said. Some of the assignments are like one file, do your thing, and you're done. Like the first assignment, I think you have to write basically code in one file. Uh, most of the programming assignments you have to write in a few different files. You generally don't have to write like 20 different files worth of things, but there's key things in each file. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, there are lots of files involved in these, in these programs. We want to give you programming assignments that are both challenging and interesting. And to do that, a lot of times we have to have a lot of back end kind of things to make it kind of work. Um, and then you do the kind of the meat of it. And uh, that's why there's lots of different types of header files and things. Really, 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 when you're going and reading your, through your assignment, just spend an hour or two looking through the header files and going, oh, that's that, and that's what this is, and oh, I better remember this, because you'll use it later, and, you'll, and that will uh, help you kind of trigger your memory that, oh, that's what I can go use. You wouldn't be, you'd be surprised at how many questions on Piazza are all about, oh, how do I do this? And somebody says, look in this header file, it's right there. And the header files have a lot of uh, comments in them, too. So that's my uh, comment on that. Uh, the late policy for this class. As it turns out, um, the late policy may or may not uh, cost you points. Uh, it's a little different than lots of other classes. Here's how it works. Um, if you submit on time, obviously you, get, you can get up to 100% of the points. That makes sense. Um, if you submit 24 hour, up to 24 hours later, your assignment is capped at 90%. So if you get an 80% on the assignment and you hand it in a day late, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get that 80%. It's just gonna, not going to take more points off. Okay, but if you had a 95, it gets capped at 90. That's how that works. Um, the same thing is true for 24 hours, it goes down to 60% cap. Um, so you're, uh, sorry, for the next 24, for 48 hours later. So you probably wanna try to hand it in at most a day late, otherwise you do get kind of penalized on lots of points. Um, we generally don't accept assignments after 48 hours unless there's very good extenuating circumstances, you're ill or you've got um, something that's uh, curricular related that's uh, not another class, but something that's, uh, that's related to uh, why you can't actually do the assignment. Job interview or something like that, email me, we'll probably, I'll probably give you a little extension for free. Uh, that's that. Let's see. The part that, oh, discussion sections, that's what's next. Um, as I said, Monday, Wednesdays are lectures. The one exception, Friday we are having lecture. Labs sections start next week. We're doing three lectures this week just so that we can get through some material um, for your project next, or for your assignment next week. Um, so there are three this week. Following this, just Monday, Wednesday, not Friday. Fridays are generally the, le the labs. Um, the discussion sections, as I said, a CA is leading them. Uh, I think I'm gonna be leading a section too. And they're uh, a little bit of theoretical things, talking about stuff we talked about in class, but then there's a lot of looking at code and going through code and then answering questions about that code and uh, doing some other kind of looking at the details of things, okay? Um, they are not mandatory in the sense that uh, if you go to all of the lab, all the discussion sections, it's 5% of your final grade um, and you just get 100% for showing up, Okay. Um, every time you miss a discussion section, uh, you, your grade counts a little bit. It counts a little bit less, and your final exam counts a little bit more, right? So that's all. It's not so much a penalty if you don't go to sections. It's just that oh, I got to do a little bit better on the on the final. And this is for people who are like, I hate going to sections. They're boring. I don't need them. Well, great. You don't have to, um, but uh, they are there for your benefit. Okay. Uh, discussion section signups. Uh, Sunday, April seventh. This Sunday at noon is when it's going to open up. Like I said, most of the sections are gonna be Friday during this time slot. Some of the sections are going to be um, on Thursday. So if you really want a Thursday section, get in there early on Sunday, like Sunday around noon, and sign up for them. Okay, I don't know exactly how many sections yet in each one, but uh, that will be available then. Okay, all right. Midterm, there are exams in this class. Um, the midterm is going to be Thursday, May 2nd, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, it's outside of class. We're going to use Blue Book. Who has used Blue Book before? Yeah, most of you guys. If you've never used it, it's just a program that you use that's kind of written in house um, and it uh, enables you to type your answers, which people tend to like. And it makes grading a little bit easier and like you don't have to worry about your handwriting and you can erase and delete and so forth. Um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, it does require a laptop. If you don't have a laptop that has a good enough battery to last two hours, let me know. We'll try to get you one. Okay, I don't want anybody to uh, not be able to do it because of that. Uh, the exams are closed book, closed notes. You do get one page back and front notes 
for the midterm. Uh, here's the big thing. You have to pass the midterm to pass the class. All right, now, what does that mean? Well, it means that most of you will pass the midterm, okay? I mean, we don't sit there and go, oh, 40% of you are out of the class because you failed the midterm. No, the, the number of people who fail the midterm is very, very small, but it is possible to fail the midterm. So you do have to do well on, on you do have to do a passing grade. Don't stress about that too much. Just know that uh, you do have to do that. Um, that does bring me to another point. How many graduating seniors do we have here? A few of you guys, right? First of all, give everybody, everybody give you guys an applause. All right, you made it through Stanford. <laughs> well, almost. <laughs> you haven't quite made it through Stanford yet. You decided to take a really hard class as your last quarter. Some of you had to do that. I'm sorry that if you had to do that, that was the way it worked out. Um, this is a challenging course. Um, the odds are good that you haven't taken follow-on uh, systems classes because you would have had to take this first. So this may be a very, very challenging course for you. Um, if you find yourself falling behind, and this goes particularly for seniors who can't retake the course or over the, or you have to take it over the summer or whatever, please, please get the help early, okay? I know uh, that's, uh, we say that in every class, but that's really, really important, okay? Um, now, multiple practice, we're gonna give multiple practice exams, we're going to uh, do that. If you, have a, uh, a, an ex if you have another competing thing at the midterm time, I know lots of people have, I think Thursday evenings might be like symphony or something like that, that's fine. You can take it earlier in the day, we'll have those details a little bit later, okay? And of course, if you do have testing accommodations, email me those as soon as you can, um, the earlier, kind of the better. There's a final exam, the final exams, 35% of your grade. It is cumulative. There are gonna be problems you'll see on file systems on the final exam. Uh, also closed book, you get two pages of notes. Uh, and it's going to be June 10th, 7 p.m. I'm sorry, June 10th, 3.30 p.m. There's an alternate at seven if you have another class that conflicts. A lot of times you say, you can't have conflicting classes. Look, I understand some people have confl conflicting classes. You can take it at the second time. If you have two conflicting classes, well, figure it out. <laughs> All right, or three conflicting classes or whatever, figure it out. Um, the, let's see, what else about the final? You do have to pass the final or pass the class as well. Again, very few people fail the final. It does happen, okay? All right, I think those are, that's the biggest thing about the uh, logistics. The final thing that really should not be, even need to be mentioned is the honor code. Look, some of these assignments are out there. Okay, your friends took these this class before or assignments are uh, online or whatever because people put them there. You should not be putting any of your assignments on public repositories, please. We will ask you to take them down. Um, but uh, if you find things online, please disregard. You want to do the assignments and uh, we have ways of checking that. So I will leave it at that. All right. What question do you have on logistics before we go into some details about file systems? Any logistics questions? No? Okay, let's jump right in. File systems. So, you guys should be familiar with Unix and Linux at this point, right? If you go and you type ls, right, you type ls, you get a list of the files that are in some directory that you happen to be in, and you may, and you may have traversed down the directory some, some distance. Uh, I need to unplug this. You may have traversed down the directory some, um, some distance to actually get there. Okay, and there are other things that you can do uh, aside from just typing ls. If you type ls-al, for instance, it gives you a more detailed list. The A stands for all files, which includes all the hidden ones, which start with a period. And it include, the L stands for give me a nice big listing of more details about the files. Okay, um, in here there are two files in particular that are interesting. One is called dot and one is called dot dot. You probably know about those from 107 as well. But those, those uh, files stand or directories stand for the current directory dot and the previous directory dot dot and this is how you traverse backwards and forwards through a directory. Okay, and then the other files in here, just the ones that exist, any others, I don't think there's any other ones that start with a period in here, but those are the hidden ones. And then there's all this other information, like this stuff out here, we're gonna go into more details in a second on that. That's your, well, it tells you whether or not it's a directory, and it's also the permissions for the file. Did you talk about permissions at all in 107? I don't think you did, yeah, okay. Permissions are basically who has access to your files. Okay, and on this list right here, it looks like I am the only one that has access because the first three things after the first dash are the user's permissions and only, the only ones that have anything in there are, 
are for the user, which is me uh, in this case. All the rest of those dashes are for the group, which you guys all belong to various groups, like the course group and some other groups. And you also belong to uh, the other category, which is everybody else. Those are the other two parts. We'll get into more details about that in a minute. Okay. Who's sending me messages? Stop sending me messages. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you can do that. You can do that. Please don't learn how to do that. It's not, it's not you know, it, it messes things up sometimes. Anyway. Um, <laughs> very nice. All right. So, um, oh, by the way, the permissions that you have are read, write, and execute. The only things you can execute are files that are uh, binary files or files that are like scripts written in languages like Python and, and so forth. Okay, that's, uh, that's when the X becomes important. Um, as I said, there's three parts to these files. Uh, there's the owner part, the group part, and the other part. And each one can have its own type of uh, permit its own permissions. Like if this this up here, like if I had this file called list and it had these permissions dash r w x r dash x r dash x that's down here. This basically means okay that the owner has read write execute privileges. The the owner being in this case me, let's say. The group can also read the file and execute it, and anybody else can also read the file and execute it. That's how permissions work. Okay. The, and we do this for security reasons. We also do it for sharing reasons, if you want to share things and so forth. Here's the interesting part about it. Because it's R, W, and X, that means there's three bits of information, which means three, with three bits of, information, bits of information, you can encode that in one uh, value that goes from 0 to 7, which would maybe make you think that we could actually use the octal base 8 system for this. And you're going, why would we ever do this? Well, here's why. Okay, If you have the following permissions, R, W, X, assume that a, a 1 means that permission is set so that you can do that. A 0 means it's set so you can't do it or it's unset. So R, W, X would be 1, 1, 1. That's 7, right? That's a 107 sort of thing. Convert binary to, um, to in this case, either decimal or hexadecimal or, for that matter, octal. And then 101 would be R dash X, and that would be 5. Well, if you take the number 755, that number is an octal number. Okay, so it's a 7, it can't go, if, if you added one to that, it would not be 756, it would be 760. Right? Oh no, sorry, it wouldn't, I'm lying. If you added, if you added one to it, it would be 756. If you added 3 to it, it would, or if you added, yeah, if you added 3 to it, it would flip over because it's base 8. The, only point, the important part is, you will often see this, just think of them as individual digits, each being those three bits of information. That's all you really need to know about that. Okay. Now, in C, we can open files. Now, you have done that before, I assume, in, uh, other, uh, in other classes like 107. Um, if you want to open a file, there's actually two different kind of overloaded ways to do it. You can use the open command, the open uh, function, which is actually a system call. Remember I said it looks like a function? It's just basically a function. And you can put the path name and then some flags. And some of those flags need a mode, which is those permissions we talked about. Okay? And you might be saying to yourself, oh great, I know how to overload functions. I know all about that. You can do that in C. I don't know if you remember from 107, but it turns out you can't overload functions in C. So how does this work? Well, go look. You can go look at uh, Stack Overflow and, and see that. Did anybody happen to look at Stack Overflow today? Yeah, yeah it, it it looks kind of um, it looks kind of like ugly. It's the, your mouse goes and it puts little stars behind it and there's banners and everything and banners whatever. It's like it says just like the '90s. They tried to make it look like the '90s because it's April Fool's Day. So anyway, that's that. Um, Let's see, there we go. Okay, hold on, there we go. Okay, uh, you know what I wanna do? I want to try this again, make it a little bit bigger, and then go right here. There we go, okay. Is that big enough? Oh, there we go, uh, it's still not making it bigger. Okay, well anyway, about the same. All right, so you can, um, you can open a file in Linux by using the open command. Okay, you can open a file to be either read only, which means you can only read from it, you can't write to it. Write only, which means you can, um, I think that's actually not the right flag. I'll look it up. But um, you can read it, uh, read only or write only, or you can do 
uh, read write, which means you can read to it and write to it, which is a little bit odd. You don't do that too often, okay? And then you can, uh, when you can do that, you can actually say, I want to create a file and I want to uh, create the file. And when you create a file, you have to pass in the permissions you want to use for it. Okay, and you can do this by doing the O underscore create without the E. This is because they wanted to save space, I guess. They decided they don't want that extra letter in there. Um, but you have to do the O create without the E. That tells you create the file. And then O E X C L says only create the file if it doesn't exist already. That might be important to you. Like try to create the file, and then if it exists, fail. Don't re like recreate the file. And so we're going to care about those. Things. Okay, let's actually, um, and by the way, the third mode is the permissions. This is actually used to, to attempt to set the permissions. Operating systems are a little weird. Okay, one of the things that the operating system does is it says, I'm going to give you a default set of permissions that I'm going to create this file with. And if you tell me to create more explicit uh, permissions, I won't let you. Which sounds a little weird, but I'll show you an example of, of how that works. You figure that out with a command called, or a function called umask, which is um, basically says what default permissions do we have, and it uh, if the bit is set, right, then if you try to set that bit for the permissions, it doesn't work. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, let's actually write our first program here. Uh, let's see, we'll call it. Um, I think I already have a the program here. We're going to call it show umask.c. Okay. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to pound include some things. Pound include studio.h, pound include uh, sys slash types.h. That's, and then another one also you have to pound include to be able to use this umask thing. Pound include, by the way, I'm, I always make mistake, mistakes when I'm typing these things in, so catch me if you find them, or if you find them, catch me, or tell me. Sys slash stat dot h, okay. And then we can do our main function, because it's just in C, might as well put the return zero in there now. And then there's a type called mode underscore t. I'm gonna call it the old mask. Here's how this works, equals umask, which is the, it's saying, hey, get me the permissions that you are going to allow me to set, okay? And I'm actually gonna set it to zero, which says allow any permissions. Here's the dirty little secret. You can make any permissions actually set. Ah, it's a little bit weird. Okay, but anyway, it's gonna do that. And then this is how you get the result. It's kind of dumb. You have to set the result to get it back. So what we can do is we can say, oh, okay, fine. Let's just set it back to our old task. It's, I think it's a kind of a, it was a weird choice, but that's the way they did it, okay? And then if we print f, umask is set to, remember it's octal, these things are octal. If you do, if you do percent, zero, three will pad it with zeros, and then you do o, that means do an octal number with three, with three places in it, okay? And then we'll do the old mask, and we'll, oops, old mask, and then we'll return zero. Okay, this, all this is doing, it's going to show you mask. What it's gonna do, it's gonna tell us what the permissions are right now. All right, zero, seven, seven. What are those three bits? What's the zero mean? Zero, 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 right? What's the uh, seven mean? One, one, one. Well, what this means, and then there's another one, one, one. What it means is the user can set any permissions. And then the group, and for the group and for anybody else, you're not allowed to set the permissions. Or in other words, it won't set those permissions. It'll just be dash, dash, dash. That's what that means. It kind of seems a little backwards. But that's what, it, uh, what it's all about. Why do we do that? Again, part of it is because uh, somebody decided they want things to be a little more secure, and they also want things to be able to uh, have some default. Um, I was talking with, do you guys know Michael Chang? Some of you took CS107 from him. Um, he was telling me today that the UMass thing is actually a really good idea for this and this and this reason, and I said, yeah, nobody really knows that. He goes, I know, nobody knows that. But anyway, that's what it's all about as far as doing that. It's just basically saying, what permissions can you set? Okay, so we just did that. Let's actually, uh, we're actually gonna write a, a quick program, and these programs are all, as I said, available for you to download or to actually to uh, clone into your own myth uh, directory somewhere. 
And as you clone, and when you clone them, you can actually look at them. Okay, every time I mention new examples, I'll put them into the into that repository. Um, the next one I want to write is a little program that actually opens a file up, or creates a file, and then sets some permissions. Okay, so let's actually do that right now. Um, this one we're gonna I'm gonna call it openx.c, and I've already put some stuff in there uh, for us here. Okay. And we are going to, uh, to do this. We're basically, as I said, we're going to open a file up, and then we are going to set its permissions to some value Okay, while we're opening it up. Okay, All right. In C, we generally don't like global variables, but constants are OK. okay? And we'll call this one k file name, and we'll just call it my file. OK, um, that is a global variable. It is a constant. All right. Um, anyone know what the K stands for? Constant. Of course, that's for some reason that's a C thing. I don't know why they always did that, but that's what it is. Uh, we'll have another one that I looked up. K file exists uh, error. And by the way, it's nice to put the K there so that anytime you use it in a file in the rest of the program, you know it's a constant. That just kind of tells you that. Okay. We'll get to what this is in a in a second. Okay. And then in main. We're simply going to say you mask zero because I actually want to set the permissions the way I want to set them, as it turns out. So you have to set it to, to tell the system, hey, I'm going to set the permissions whatever, however I want. So I don't care what the you mask is in this case, okay? And then we do this thing. We get a what we call a file descriptor. Descriptor. We're going to three to two fifty, right? Yeah, we go to two fifty. File descriptor, uh, which equals in this case uh, open k file name. Okay, and then we have to tell it. Yeah, this is the what it was wrong on the slide. I'll fix the slide. Read write only is what we're going to do with this. I can bitwise or it with o create, and I can bitwise with it with o e x c l, which means what? Write only. Create the file and only create the file if it doesn't already exist. That's what those three flags mean. Okay, and then I'm going to change. I'm going to make the permissions zero six four four. Okay, six four four. Six is what one 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 zero, right? And four is one zero zero, and one zero zero is the other four. Notice that I prepended this number with a zero. What base do you think that means it's in? Octal, as it turns out. That's how you make an octal number in uh, C. Okay. All right. And then we'll check if file descriptor. This is our error checking. You won't have to do too much error checking for class, but we generally I try to do it as much as we can in lecture or in the real slides to show you how to do it because you should do it in real life. Print f. Okay. There was a problem opening or creating. Uh, let's call it percent %s like that, and k file. By the way, in Vim, I don't know if you know, how many people you took 107 last quarter and learned Emacs? <sighs> Nick, <I'm> telling you. <laughs> Emacs is fine. If you want to use Emacs, you can use Emacs. I'm a Vim person these days anyway. Um, okay. If there was an error, we can actually use this thing called erno to determine the error and, oops file exists error. If error number equals file exists error, we can print out, okay, the file already exists, right, like that. Okay, if we don't know the file name, we just uh, print out unknown error, error no, okay, percent %d and error no. Did you use Erno in CS107? You may have a little bit, maybe not. Erno is a global variable that's based in C, and it basically gets set when your program has some error. It's a little bit strange that it, they do it that way, but that's the way they do it. And in this case, I'm just going to return negative 1 to basically say, hey, our program is not, did not do so well. And then we're going to close this file descriptor like that, and we're just going to return 0. All right. So, what type is a file descriptor? An integer. 
When you open a file, you get back an integer. <laughs> a lot of times a very low numbered integer, like five or four or something like that. Um, file descriptors are a low level way of saying, here's the number for a particular file. We're gonna go into details about that uh, later in the week, about how that actually works. <laughs> Did anybody see any typos in there? We'll find out. Open X. Okay, so if I do open X, right? All right, just it just runs, right? And the file that I call created was called what? My file, l my file, and there it is. Notice that it permissions are read and write, right? And then and remember it starts at the second after the second one here. So the permissions were read and write for the owner, read for you for a group, and read for others, and that's how we set that. Right? What's going to happen if I run it again? There was a problem creating my file. It already exists, right? We checked that, right? If you want to find out all these error numbers, I had to look this up. Error no dash L will give you a list of all the different file numbers. And if we go up here and we look at, there's a lot of them. If we look at 17, it says file exists, and that one will be in there. We will use a lot of error numbers as we go through the course for various things. Um, in some cases, we use it, there was an error, but we don't care about the error, and we want to know that it was that error that we were expecting. Sounds a little weird now, but we will get there. Um, and uh, you will use these to do that. So you'll get familiar with that, okay? And uh, by the way, how on Linux would I say error number L and then be able to stop the file halfway through, or part of the way after one page. Anybody know? The command less works just fine, and then you can go up and down in less and see it, right? That works pretty well. That's a nice way of doing it. So you should get used to those sorts of things uh, as well. Okay, so that's the basics of file systems, okay? Um, the, we're gonna look at a lot of other low-level operations. And by the way, UMask and Open are two, uh, two of these uh, functions that aren't really functions, they're system calls. When you say open, your program transfers control over to the operating system, and the operating system's kernel does the work to open the file, and then gives you back, your program back, control. As far as you're concerned, it looks just like a file, uh, a function call, but we have to know some of the details about what's happening under the hood, okay? Um, let's, let's do one other thing and then I'll let you guys go because it is the first class. Um, let's emulate the copy command, cp, okay? If you do cp, right, if we do cp, I've got a file called copy.c and I'll call it copy, copy.c, this is getting a little meta, right? If you do that, now there's two files, copy.c and copy, copy.c, right, which are exactly the same, okay? Let's remove copy, copy.c. Okay, and what we want to do is we just want to write a, a quick little program to copy a file. Okay, and we use that by doing the, the open command and also, okay, we are going to use uh, two other system calls called read and write, which do what you imagine. Reading from a file and then writing to a file. Okay, let's actually just quickly do this one up right now. Uh, let's see, copy.c. Okay, I've got most of it. I've got the beginning parts of it in here because I don't want to. I want to be able to. Uh, let's just do the formatting correctly. There we go. Okay, so this is basically it says to run this. You do. You have the file name or the the copy command file one and gets copied into file two like that. Okay. Well, how does this actually work? Okay, we need an in file. So we have a file descriptor open argv1, which is the first one, and o read only. Okay, says I'm only going to read from that file, so I should open it as such. And then we have it, the out file, which is another open, which is the other one, open argv2. And this one we are going to do o write only. And, oops, and o create without the e, and o e XCL, and then we'll do 0644 again. Is it going to create it with 0644 if I don't do the UMask? Probably not, but who cares? We don't know that. Okay, you can set your own UMask as the user, by the way, through Linux if you wanted it to do that. Okay, but anyway, that's how we would do that. Now, let's do this. Let's create a buffer of 1,024 bytes long. Okay, and then we will do S size T bytes red 
equals. Now, an S size T, well, that's a weird one. You might have used size underscore T in um, 107. An S size underscore T is a signed size underscore T. It allows us to have negative values for the specific purpose of negative 1 saying that's going to be like the, uh, it's going to say there was an error. It's the only reason they use an S size T. Otherwise, it would use a size T. But that's C for you. All right. So anyway, bytes read. Okay, equals, well, we're going to read, and how do we do this? We read from the file descriptor, we read into the buffer, so we pass the buffer in, and we read the number of bytes, not bugger, <laughs> buffer, there we go, okay, there we go. We read the number of bytes into that, okay, and then, and that tells us how many bytes read. Now, what could cause a program to not read all the number of bytes we pass in to, to the size of buffer? If it's smaller, if the file is only 10 bytes long, it's not going to read all 1,024. Why? What else? There's actually one. There's actually a very interesting way, thing that might happen. It might be that you tried to read in so much data that your program got time shifted by to, or got taken off the processor. Some other program could run, and it only returned so many bytes. This will almost never happen with reading local files, but it happens all the time when you're reading network data. Okay, if you're reading network data and you try to read 1,024 bytes, you might get 480 bytes, even though there's plenty more bytes there, they're not, not all available. This is all about time slicing. So you have to be a little bit careful with that, and you have to make sure to only try to write the number of bytes you read, okay, for a number of uh, different reasons. Now, if bytes read equals zero, break. Now, one thing that I kind of just lied to you a little bit in the sense that, um, the, the other reason you might not get a read of all the bytes, this will block until all the bytes are available, as it turns out. Um, that, ha that happens if there are more than 1,024 bytes. It will, or it, well, if there are 1,024 bytes to read, it will wait until they're all read in, in this case. But in general, you can, for networking and things, we don't necessarily block on that. Okay, if the number of bytes read is zero, that means that we're done reading because no bytes came back, as it turns out. Okay, and then we now have a regular size t bytes written equals zero, while bytes written is less than bytes read. Okay, bytes written plus equals, okay. Write, we also write to a file descriptor, this time the out one, buffer plus, bytes written, and then that's the location we are going to look for in the buffer, as it turns out, okay? And then bytes read minus bytes written, like that, okay? And we are going to have this strange while loop like that. Okay, I'm missing one, hang on. Let's see, where did I go wrong here? Maybe... Let's see, there's one, hang on, I bet, no, is that my phone being? Hang on, that was a spam call. Anybody get those these days? I heard that that's like tripled in the past year, the number of like robot calls, kind of crazy. Okay, hold on a sec, uh, let's see, while bytes, well, well, we'll check it when we get it, but anyway, point is that after you do this, then you want to actually close the file and then close the two files and then return zero. But there's an, there's an error here. I'm just going to make it and see what happens. There it is. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. If but not inside the break. Or not uh, 23, huh? All right. Let's see. Did I, not, did I miss a while statement? I did miss a while statement. Okay, right here we need a while statement that says while true. This basically says do this until the file is, that was the big mistake there, do this until the file is uh, done. So what have we done here? We have opened two files, one that we're going to read from, one that we're going to write to that we cr created. Okay, then we are going to read 1,024 bytes at a time, okay, and if we get back zero it means there were no, no bytes left to read. Okay, so we can stop reading because we're done with the file. And then we have this weird while loop where we say while the bytes written is less than the bytes re read, get back the number of bytes we've written using the write command. 
and then go down into the buffer a certain distance of the number of bytes we've already written to get the rest of it. This is the same idea where you're not sure if all your bytes are going to be written all at once. So you have to do this weird while loop, okay? And that's how it works, okay? And then you should remember to close your files at the end. We do use Valgrind to make sure that you do that. Okay, make, copy, there it is, copy. Okay, let's do copy.c to copy, copy.c, and diff copy.c and copy, copy.c. There we go, they're the same. Okay, so that's how that worked. Not too difficult as far as like what's going on, but there's some nuances in there. You can't write all the bytes at once and expect that they all wrote. You can't read all the bytes at once necessarily and expect that they all read, except in this case it does, we know that it blocks before it does that. Okay, um, and that's, the, that's the, the way the copy program works. And the copy program on your computer is not that much more, the CP command is not that much more advanced than this. Okay, all right, so a couple other things about this. Um, like I said, you should close your files uh, as you do that, and let's see, what else? Oh, if you were used to C and C++, lots of times you'll use what we call file pointers, uppercase F-I-L-E, and I-O streams and so forth. That's a higher level that uses read and write at a, for you, basically. It knows how to do those, those uh, while loops and so forth. Why are we doing it in this class where we use read and write? Sometimes you have to because of the types of things we're doing. And sometimes you want to because you, uh, you, know, you want to get that lower level access which might be faster, which isn't buffered, and so forth. And you might actually want that, okay? A lot of times you use streams and other, and file pointers because it's just easier, go for it. In this class, most of the time we use read and write because we need to for various reasons. Okay. Let's stop there, 10 minutes early. If you have questions, come on up. I'll stick around until the end of class. Uh, Wednesday's next class, and we'll see you then.